Okay, now welcome to the Last Life Ever podcast. I'm Jillian Sidoti, and this gentleman here is... Jeffrey Holst. Hi, Jeffrey. Welcome, everybody. Today, we had the great opportunity to interview Lebo, David Lebetard, who is an artist. And Jeff, his art's really interesting. Why don't you explain what his art is? So... So he is the innovator of postmodern cartoon expressionism. He talks a little bit about that in the interview, so I won't get into that too much. But the point is, he's actually the guy who started a whole new school of art. I mean, that's crazy. That's like uh, cubism or something. It's postmodern cartoon expressionism. His art appears all over the world. It's in museums. It's on the sides of building. It's right behind behind me here these the reverse mirror thing is confusing but right behind me here it appears in my living room on a daily basis and i just love how insightful this gentleman is jillian what do you think anything else our guests need to know before we bring david onto the show well the thing about his art is that uh, one thing you're going to notice if you go to his website uh, leboart.com is he he brings in everyday observations into this cartoon world. It's, it's really quite, quite amazing. And, and so when I started looking at his art on his website, um, I decided to do a little more exploring and I found a quote for him that I thought was, that really just sums it up and, and brings a whole new, um, thought to art that's otherwise considered a cartoon. My aim is creating my aim in creating is to explore the purest, most spiritual elements of the arts and sciences from astronomy to history, from music to physics, and to interpret them through the language of cartoons, giving them a unique and vibrant voice. After all, cartoons are a primordial form of expression that have always combined images in order to tell stories. We have only to think of rock paintings, hieroglyphics, or religious iconography for our proof. In reality, even when we look at Picasso's work after 1905, it all becomes very hard-edged yet organic, the very essence of cartooning. And I thought that was so amazing. So I encourage you guys to go over to leboart.com. Um, also, please recognize I wore my most colorful shirt I could find today because we're interviewing an artist and I want to get credit for that for thinking. <laughs> I put an original Lebo painting behind me rather than wearing a colorful shirt. I don't so, have a Lebo painting, so I'm You should get yourself one, Jillian. And with that, let's bring on David Liebetard. Help me, my brother. Can you lend me a hand? As I walk through this land of confusion. If we give to each other, then there's nothing to take. Let's live life for the moment before it slips away. Cairo is that like um, we just had a guest on that that's like a big fan of Egypt, Zora O'Neill, and we were talking um, about how much she loves going to Egypt, and I'm I'm right there with her. I love I love Egypt, and and you know your art is loaded with Egyptology type stuff, and I know from watching your Facebook lives that you have like books on hieroglyphics and stuff that you just kind of hold up and look at and you, and you're using it as a big influence. But you said to me just before we started recording, you've never been to Egypt. Wait a minute. Of- that's, right. that's crazy to me. You have books on hieroglyphics and stuff like that, but you've never been to Egypt. hundred percent. I'm interested in Mars too, but I don't have any interest in going. <laughs> there. So, Elon Musk would be so disappointed in you. Yeah. No interest in going to Mars. Yeah. So, but, uh, well, hold on. Let me give you a hypothetical. So say you were in Egypt and there was a beggar on the street and somebody made you the offer that uh, if you suck that beggar's big toe for a minute, you would be able to be invisible for 24 hours. 
would you do it? Um, probably actually, if I believed <laughs> it would work. Yeah, I think I probably would. I would use a little antiseptic wipe that I keep in my pocket first. Yeah. Yeah. A dental dam, a dental yeah. dam, perhaps. Yeah, right. Yeah, if I had one, definitely would do that. Yes. Jillian, oh, can, you you there? can you get in on that? Yeah, I, I don't know. I'd have to you you've got a good point. I'll give you that. You got a good point. So, yeah, I mean, look, it's it. Look, there's no doubt that there's some stuff about Egypt that's you know on the dirty side, right? Like, give us they, your there's give us your experience, Jeff. Well, listen, I, I I admit it. I I fully admit that every time I've gone to Egypt, and every person I've ever gone to Egypt with has gotten some kind of gastrointestinal <laughs> issue while they were there. I spent six weeks in Egypt though, and only got sick once. My dad almost died i think when we went to egypt last time he was so sick he literally couldn't get out of bed and we had to like have a doctor come to the hotel room to oh. treat him but um well that's one good the, reason to go i guess at the same time at the same time if you ask my dad right now his favorite place in the world is egypt like he loved, I mean, he loved going yeah. there and he's always trying to get like his wife to go and like, he just would love to go back. And um, my grandfather, my dad's dad, when he was dying of um, colon and liver cancer, went back to Egypt in the, in the early eighties, because even though he could barely function, he was like, I just want to see Egypt one more time before I die. Right. So, so like you can say, oh yeah, there's these terrible experience, but, but you know, people get sick in Mexico if they don't wash their food properly. Right. That's like right. you can mitigate that by drinking bottled water, eating at fancy McDonald's places. Cause they usually have good hygiene at the McDonald's in Cairo, <laughs> but you know, you, you miss out on some of the experience if you don't eat the street food. So <laughs> I end up sick. What can I say? The Listen, bacteria, the, ro the, old, the roasted scorpion and all that. Yeah, well, I actually have never eaten roasted scorpion. I've never even seen that in Egypt. I did see that in China once. Um, and, uh, you know, actually, um, when you do your little, like, worm smoking a cigar thing that you were doing, like, a few uh, a few weeks ago, a month ago. Dirty, Jeff? You know, like, you know, you're painting your um, drawings of the worm smoking a cigar. Yeah. I always think of the scorpions on a stick for some reason oh, okay. in, uh, in in Beijing. So. Wait, worm smoking a cigar? Is this on your Facebook page? I mean, this is a big deal. Yeah, It's, it's a big really deal, unearthing. yeah. No, and no and usually like... Is really unearthing some underground shit right now. Yeah, <laughs> it's like like wearing a sombrero, smoking a cigar, you I'm know, stuff like up. that. Yeah. Sometimes he wears a derby hat. That's right, derby hat. That's a good one, too, yeah. Uh, he's a worm smoking a cigar. He's sort of the uh, the creation of our collective un unconscious. Yeah, the it's the corona. It's his version of coronavirus collective. Joey. No, it was yeah, it was our, he, it's our our version. Yeah, he'd just do these Facebook lives and he'd say, "What should I draw?" And people would say, "How about this? How about that?" And like it just sort of evolved into a reoccurring character, a worm smoking a cigar. That's right. And it's okay. amazing. It, does he have a name? I don't think he ever had a name. I think he just kind of shape shifts. So it's hard we to need, Yeah. I mean, I feel like the <laughs> shapeshifter <laughs> needs a name. He just comes up in every kind of situation. And then it became Medusa smoking a cigar with hair made of worms smoking cigars. So then, yeah. it, then it went kind of, you know, in the DEF CON 2. The Medusa worm is what you're talking about. That's there, right. Actually. That's right. So I mean, yeah. there's a lot. There's a lot. I, I actually like, so I have this, um, I have I, I I've never admitted this um, on on air before, but I'm gonna I, I have a Picasso. It's a very cheap Picasso, and it's Medusa, um, and it's like it's kind of like that actually. I think you really like this. I'm gonna bring it up. This is uh, the one I have. I have by the way, just to be clear, my Medusa Picasso is like. Um, it's like, you know, really cheap, like pencil signed print that's not worth anything. I mean, a couple thousand bucks, so it's not free, but it's not. I um, mean, if somebody saw it in a state sale, would it be a good buy? Would they yeah, I mean, if it was signed by Picasso, yeah. I mean, this is not mine, obviously. I just Googled it. But this this is the uh, the image here is um, and apparently you can buy it for $100 on Amazon. So that's what that's happens. a lighthearted piece there. You put yeah, that right? like, I kind of wish that I had my... Um, I'd be scared to have that in my house. Oh, it's on my wall. Like when you walk into my house, you'd probably be scared to visit my house is what you're saying. Um, <laughs> well, probably, that's, most likely because you'd be standing there naked holding a giant kitchen knife. So. Um, <laughs> and I'm pretty sure that wouldn't be the case. I do have a worm that smokes a cigar on my balcony, though. So. Oh, okay. I thought you were going to say in your pants. So. No. <laughs> oh, man. If you, you said that, that would be inappropriate. You do realize now we're not going to be able to share this video with anyone. No, that's not true. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> like, 
<laughs> well, you know what? You're right. It's not our fault that our guest is perverted. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. So it's, all, it's all relative. It's all relative. It is all relative. But I want to get into you. Enough about Wow. Justin. That <laughs> is perverted, what? Jillian. Wow. What? You're like, that's goodness. I want to hear more about Jeff's gastrointestinal issues when he went to Cairo. <laughs> Listen, you I know everybody does. I'm telling you, one of these days you're going to come to Cairo and you're going to understand how amazing it is. Oh, well, I, don't, I certainly don't look forward to getting uh, Mon is Montezuma's revenge a uh, racist term or what is that? Can we say? Uh, that it or? probably it probably is, but they call it Pharaoh's revenge in Cairo. <laughs> do they really because, call it Pharaoh's revenge? Well, yeah, of course they do. I mean, why wouldn't they call it that, right? No, look, I didn't know if that look, was really a thing. Th this is an actual photo of mine, just to be so you can see. Like mine, the difference on mine is it's signed by Picasso right there in the bottom left-hand corner. Tiny little pencil thing, and that's there the only go. difference. I mean, I that is... Picasso me. did breathe on it. You got to assume he breathed on it. Well, yeah, I mean, it's not quite as good as when Lebo puts his thumbprint on something, but... Or the mushroom. You know what the mushroom stamp is? Have you ever heard of that? Uh, I don't Stop! think I want to hear about it. I know what he... <laughs> I don't think I want to hear that. <laughs> All right. Jilly I clearly heard about, about, about it. I didn't make it up. I didn't make it up. <laughs> that's... I will give you that. Fair All enough. right. All right. So let's let's talk more about um about art and less about um about mushrooms. How's that sound? I mean, okay, we can get off the subject. Maybe we get around to it later. Who knows? Oh uh, yeah, fair enough. Well, so listen. So thank you so much for coming back. So you know, just for our regular viewers, we did actually try this once before, and we broadcast it live in our Facebook group, yeah. and the audio wasn't really great. So you've Not come great. back and agreed to do it again, which is amazing. And this is we can actually hear you this time, which is helpful for a podcast. It turns out. Um, and by the way, I apologize for sharing my screen for all the people that listen to this on podcasting apps later and don't have visuals but if you just google picasso medusa you can probably see what we're looking at but anyway so david when we talked before you told us about um sort of how you got into art and how you, you know how you decided to make that decision can we go back to that part like wh how did you make a decision to become a full-time artist i mean that's full -time. yeah yeah um i don't know if it was actually so much a decision i think uh energy time and energy wise as a kid i i was fortunate to grow up in a household that was serene and we were in, we were encouraged to sort of find our interest within that and i always just gravitated towards wanting to draw and uh, particularly draw cartoons i would see them in the comic strips because my we always had the newspaper and uh it just really got my attention and i and i had a lot of um what would probably be now attention deficit stuff and uh, you know they, they they had me labeled as hy hyperactive in school and so on and so forth, but that that activity always calmed me down, and there was always plenty of paper and and, and and pencils to work with. So I just really developed from there. And then uh, when I early teens, I could just ride. We had a, a library about a, a mile and a half from our house, so I could just go there, and then I just continued doing the same thing, but going through the whole library and kind of finding books that had pictures and symbols and anything that could be translated into drawing, and just kept doing it. Uh, really through college, and I took a few fine art classes. I ended up switching majors to more towards philosophy and art history, uh, but but keeping a, a real rigorous study uh, discipline going for for cartooning. Uh, at the same time, I was going to college for three years. I worked at the International Museum of Cartoon Art, curating and archiving cartoon art work for them from you know going back 150 years, roughly. Um, and then when I got out of college, uh, through some advice of a couple friends, I started doing what were very small black and white drawings turned into large murals and adding color to them. And I've been able to, um, and then selling paintings out of the back of my car. Those are really the foothold of how I got into becoming a professional artist. And that was when I was about 21 years old. And then from there, I'm 47 now. So I've been doing it that long. So you sold art out of the back of your car? Like, what did would you do? Just like open your trunk and like set the art up, and hopefully people would come by and buy it. No, what I did was I did I was doing murals, and because the mural, the scale of the murals, and people would ask about the murals, and then I would have photographs of the paintings, and then the oh. paintings would be in the car, or they wouldn't be in the car, and I'd be coming back the next day, and they would come the next day and buy the painting from me. I'd have it. That's so you so just cool. show them a photograph of the painting and say, yeah, you know, okay, I'll bring it tomorrow or whatever. Right. So that's, I bought, I bought mine out of the back of a car, I think, right? The one that I have behind me here. Absolutely. After I, I, I think I remember, I remember, I remember that. Of a, back of a submarine. 
Yeah, it might have been a summary. <laughs> no, I um, I imagine I would have gotten a better deal if I knew you 25 years ago and was buying it out of the back of your trunk. Everything was pretty much 500 bucks back then. Yeah, that, yeah, that, that would have been a better deal. Even before, <laughs> even before then, when I was a kid, uh, a few years before then, to a, a, a cartoonist I was studying named R. Crumb, uh, I, he would collect uh, port, uh, yearbooks from different decades dating back to the 10s and the 20s. And then he would practice doing portraiture by looking at yearbooks because you get these all these different faces and you just draw them in different ways you know, and then you learn. So I was able to learn uh, to do that through that process. Um, and then from there, uh, I was able to do caricatures. So the very first artwork that I did that I got paid for was when I was at the museum and people would just call for a caricature artist. And at the time it was 75 bucks an hour. And I was like, I'm like, I'll learn how to do caricatures, even though I wasn't very good at it. And I'd show up and I would do it. And I made, you know, that and that's the first money I really made at art. Yeah. And, so. you know, I think that's um, a lot of artists that I've known. That's been the first money they made. I think it's that's sort of the that's the opportunity. Right. People want people just want to they, they go. They want to remember themselves being at a place and they get a quick drawing done of themselves. Yeah. Uh, Amusement parks. There's there's an artist I know that started off drawing characters at an amusement park, for example, and uh, so that's that's really cool. So, uh, 25, 26 years now, you've been pretty much professional artist. Absolutely. Um, and you know, we talked about this before in our previous recording, but you sort of are the the front man of an entire new school of art. Um, okay. Why don't you tell us a little bit about the, um, it's postmodern cartoon expressionism. Did I get that right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I don't know if it's the front man of anything by any stretch, but um, during that period of being at the cartoon museum, there was two other cartoonists that we became friends. One actually that's an animator and, and does all motion uh, uh, length movies uh, for lots of different studios. And then the other who's still doing, uh, cartooning to this day. And we would, uh, go out and we would go and practice drawing on location in different places, gesture drawing and, and doing time drawings and things like that. But it's all about that, that discipline. So we were really disciplining ourselves to do that. And then we're like, man, you know, we're kind of combining, we're trying to combine these different elements together, like this old style cartooning, uh, with kind of more expressionistic type, you know, individual kind of feeling to it and taking it out of the dimensions that we've seen it. So we came up with that term because postmodern, at least as it relates to art, is after Picasso died. So we're like, okay, well, that's postmodern. Uh, the cartooning part is evident in, in the work. And then the expressionism part is that is in fine art history, you get Van Gogh and you get Gauguin, for instance, and that's the, that's the beginning of expressionism in art, in, in modern Western art, because that's the first time we start to see artists really creating for the sake of creating and because they have something to say. It's no longer just about history or portraiture or still life. It be, can become about that individual story. So that's where the expressionism part comes from. Uh, that's really interesting. And I, I, you know, because I think like when you start saying cartoon, that can throw somebody off as to like being dismissive of that. It's not important to art. Right. Yeah. Um, and yet I think like, I, and you know, I talked to Jeff about this, why I love your art so much is because it is very thoughtful and thought provoking. And one of my favorite pieces of art that you have is this one right here. Let me see if I can share it. This one right here, be still, this too shall pass, mm -hmm. which incorporates a part of one of my favorite Bible verses, be still and know that I'm God. Mm -hmm. And yet there's so much activity going on in this picture, right? right. In this painting. Like it's it be still, my love, this too shall pass, with like almost I feel noise in the pic the painting. Okay. So um which you know. And I also see joy in this painting where, you know, there's, there's joy, but joy shall pass just as any bad time shall pass right. as well. Right. That's the so, idea. Yeah. <laughs> that is the idea. Wow. I did it. I interpreted it correctly. Yay. Yeah, yeah. But, well, yeah. And well. that's the thing. Like what I find fascinating about your art is that you have a lot of it. Like I, I was digging and digging and digging and you have this whole series of musical art, but beyond the musical art that you have, you also have, um, 
all, all kinds of decor. You know, you can buy decor right, and, and, and t-shirts and stickers and apparel. Yeah. No, and, I think that's and, great because yeah. I think, and I'll tell you why I think it's great. I think it's great because it gives people an opportunity to get a small piece of art and carry it with them or use it in other ways other than just hanging it in your house so that nobody can ever see it except unless somebody comes in your house. So I think, I think these forms of art are fantastic and, you know, allow you to, to bring your art with you and, and have it in different, different ways. And the other thing you have with your art is that you have um, a lot of this on aluminum. So it can, it's, it's weather resistant. So you could hang yeah. it outside. Yeah. Um, what made you decide that this, like doing all these different mediums was the way to go? Um, I guess on a personal level, I, when, when growing up in South Florida, when we used to go to uh, Disney World and we would leave and there would be all these, there'd be these little stores that had these tons of bins. There were all different kind of reproductions of, of Disney characters and things like that, but affordable things. They probably still have it. But I remember that being very akin to what I would look at like a gallery experience as an adult because you yeah. have a you know, limited amount of resources or whatever, you, you know, however much you can spend. And then there's all these options that you can have. And I loved all those options. Even just if I didn't get them, I just love being able to look through it, the way they smell, the way they just have all look together. So I think, and even looking at it from a cartoonist standpoint when I was a kid is, you know, peanut stuff or not Calvin Hobbes, but peanuts and Garfield and, and other cartoons that, you, that we grew up seeing uh, all had a lot of merchandising around them. And to me, that's... Yeah that was a great part of my childhood was being able to tell the stories that I wanted to tell through those things. So I think when I started becoming a, you know, more of a fine artist, I still had an approach, which was like, no, no, if something's, if an idea is good enough, or if, it, if it's interesting enough, you should be able to do different iterations of it. And it should be able to pass through different realities, if you would, and, uh, and still be interesting. Uh, so I never really, well, that, and then coupled with the idea that in nature, when we study, biology and and symbiosis in nature the animals that adapt and can apply themselves to the most amount of things are the ones that survive and i think as an artist and the 15 years that i spent before being an established studio artist thankfully that that's been the, the last number of years now it was always about being able to meet opportunity and being able to have people say well hey you've never done this before but we can commission you to do this if you learn it and i think i it made me a better artist and a better person. I think I apply that to the way that I share my art with the world. That's really cool. That's really cool. Now, the other thing I know, um, it, it's funny because you have all this, this great art that's accessible to, you know, anybody really, uh, anybody can, can get a piece of art, whether they get it as an accessory, one of your pieces of art, whether they get it as an accessory or as a full blown piece of art. But you also do these huge installations for major companies like, um, you know, Microsoft. And I saw you do Les Claypool, who I loved as a kid. I loved Les Claypool as a kid because I was a bass player. So I, I've always thought he was yeah. great. And and even um even painted the hull of a cruise ship, right? I mean that's yeah. huge. I mean that's, that's those are billion dollar boats essentially. Yeah, that I designed. I didn't actually. Paint oh, you didn't actually it, paint it, but yeah. designed it. Sure. Yeah. But I mean, but the the thing is, like, when this is one of the things I do love about you and about your art is that you share it across this like Jillian was saying, this broad spectrum of, you know, the, the welcome to Miami mural is a perfect example of that. Um, somebody who shows up in, in Miami can just, you just, you're just going to see it. You're going to drive past it. You can stop and take a photo. I have this great photo of myself in front of it, actually, where there's um, manatees swimming in the water right in front of the building. It sounds oh, like nice. there's there a little channel in front of it. <laughs> but David, how did you, like, for, for anybody out there who's an aspiring artist and wants to do it commercially and, and make money from it um, or has a child who's interested in, in becoming an artist and not necessarily being a starving artist, how did you get – forgive the term gigs like that. Like, what did you have to do to like get the mur the Miami mural or to work for Microsoft or the beastie boys or any of these? Yeah. Groups? I mean, a lot of it, the majority, because my approach and I didn't have the internet for a lot of, of my career to be able to bolster myself off of. So it was really just word of mouth and showing up and doing it and getting one opportunity to a next um, meeting opportunities. Like I remember there was one year, that I was working with a retail outlet and I was listening to somebody have a phone call about framing and looking, they had about, I don't know, a hundred stores or something. And I knew a framer locally and, and I was listening to the numbers they were talking about. And I was like, man, I'm like, 
I'm like, can I bid on that framing too? And she's like, sure, you know. And I, but and I ended up just being a third party to to getting this framing contract, and I made a hundred thousand dollars that year. Wow, that, more than yes. I made from art that year. You know what I mean? Yeah. So a lot of it, and it wasn't anything unethical at all. It was just meeting opportunity and finding opportunity. And, and the way that I've always tried to do it is a real grassroots level, and also being honest with people and really trying to do right by everybody and also maneuver in that environment. And growing up in Miami, which is a tourist place and a place where there's a lot of shade, shady people, they say Miami is a, a sunny place for shady people. And uh, when you grow up here, it's not like anywhere where, you know, in the suburbs it is, but in the, in the metropolitan area, it's, it's kind of like cutthroat and it's real cutthroat because you don't just have people it's not like New York, in my opinion, where you just have this people are hard and it's just, you know, if you're hard, you can get along here. You have sort of the rougher element from a lot of different places all in one place. So that's all from Latin America. Now all from Eastern Europe as well, all from the islands, the Caribbean, all coming to one place. And a lot of them are shady and they're really shiesty people. So wow. growing up and doing business, especially selling art, which is what I was doing. So I would get commission work to answer your question through word of mouth. And then I would put on exhibitions of my work, usually at restaurants. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And those restaurants would become my sort of outpost, thankfully. And I'm so grateful for them because what would turn out, what would start as me hanging artwork inevitably with a series of restaurants ended up with them really letting me eat there for free as honest as, as long as I wanted and bring, and they wanted me to host people there. And I was able to sell my work out of there. That's uh, awesome. And they never That's even charged cool. me a commission or anything. So I was able to keep the fine art going through that. And then I would do commission work, you know, back and forth and just kind of ping pong and just hustle. Yeah. So I think what I'm hearing in the undertone is that you've treated it like a business from the beginning though. I mean, you really thought of it, like, how can I make this work? And you, cause you, we were talking about this before when we recorded last time about how you've gotten into like doing profit and loss statements and all this other stuff. Mm -hmm. um, I'm assuming you didn't start out with a P and L like, you know, in a business plan, <laughs> no. but it does sound like you've, you've tried to the whole time to figure out how can I make this work? How can I make this work? And you just kept pursuing that. Yeah. I would have, you know, amounts that I would want to make every year that I felt were adequate to be able to provide for my lifestyle, which was pretty minimal and then be able to save towards owning something. And, you know, I, I definitely thankfully had influences around me that were showing me how to save my money properly and, and invest it in different ways and things like that. Um, and then when I started with Park West, that just became exponential. And then I was able to really put away large amounts of money and buy property and invest on higher levels and things like that. And oddly enough, now that, that you know, things are supposed to be leveling off for, for me, things have been pretty good, you know, in terms of with Park West still and then growing the website and other opportunities. That's, that's really, okay. Let's back up for a second. Do you think that your, you know, the gravitation towards minimalism was a huge factor in your success? When you say minimalism in terms of like a lifestyle? Yeah. When you first started out, you mentioned that you, you gravitated towards minimalism or. Yeah. You, I mean, yeah. to a degree now I'm really been simplifying. So now I'm understanding it on a different level, but, but yeah, it was always about and, and that's part of the allure of it once you're in in that lifestyle, because it's very much a bohemian lifestyle. When you're an artist full time, the places that you frequent and the things that you do, especially as a young artist, are cutting edge. You know, they're, they're really where a lot of different things that will affect the mainstream come from. So it was really nice to be in that environment and be fully immersed in it. You know, there was no plan B. At one point when I when I finished college and I realized that I could make money doing murals and selling paint out of the back of my car. To me at that point, there was no plan B. It was just about, and I used the term, even though I've never practiced martial arts, Kung Fu, because Kung Fu is about discipline and hard work and understanding forms, complete forms. And that's what I was doing with the art that I was learning. And then as I, as I started to become a man, graduated college, then I was on the street and I was like, all right, I'm going to take this form and I'm going to eat from this form and I'm going to be able to, you know, hopefully God willing sur survive by practicing my form and this form of art. Wait, I want to back up because you said something really huge in, in that whole thing there, which you said is you started off middle, you started off being a minimalist and now you're really understanding minimalism mm -hmm. like in a different way. Yeah. Uh, and you're, and you're gravitating towards it. Even did I hear you correctly when you said you're gravitating towards it even more? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that this, well, even before this whole COVID thing started, I had gone through a series of things that really was already, I was already there with it. And then now 
that we've had this condensed period of time. Yeah, it's just about like we had a for instance, we had a production space uh, outside. So I have thankfully we have two two apartments where we live here on Miami Beach and then one separate apartment that I use as my studio, which is plenty enough space for me. But I had gotten another production studio because I had employees and we were producing art on a just a different level. Well, during this COVID thing, I realized, oh, if I, you know what? I'm not actually making enough with what's going on over there. So if I just shrink this production space down, don't take in any of that overhead, don't do that work anymore because it's not even covering what's going on over there. I can just kind of consolidate and be have that much less that's going out every month, which actually increases how much is going in every month. So almost like a less is more principle. Totally like a less is more. And as conversely or additionally, Brenda and I, my fiance, we wanted, we do a lot of traveling. And normally with Park West, I'm in Alaska three or four months or rather three or more, three or four weeks out of the summer. So we, and this is, you know, will to power and manifesting and stuff. We're like, man, you know, we'd love to spend a month up in the mountains in Southern mountains. And I just kind of put the word out there and through a good friend of mine, he has a friend that wants to collect my work that has an Airbnb property up there on 20 acres. Uh, and we're going to use it for the month that I'm just going to basically have all these commissions that through park West lined up that I'm just going to be able to go out hiking and do all be out in nature every day, but also be painting every day and, and creating all this work and then being able to turn it in when I get back. And that's a full month of work. Wow. So that, that's really kind of like the master plan is to be living like that. And to me, that's really minimal. And, and what we're going to be exchanging for that stay, normally that where we're staying would cost about $10,000 for that month. And I'm doing it in exchange for a painting. Wow. So How moving, cool is that? Yeah, it's wonderful. And I think both of us you know, are thrilled about it. And that's the way yeah. it should be. And that's really the way that I got by when you were asking before is just always trying to see what I do as a commodity to be able to work with people in society. Sometimes it's for money. Some, most of the time growing up, it was for trading for things. You know, I can That's remember, cool. I can, and I'll just keep it short, but uh, I used to have a four F-150, uh, a really big pickup truck. And I wasn't very good at, at parking it and stuff. Every panel on it at one point was dented up. This was years ago. And I had a little paperback book of my work in the, in the front seat. So I was showing it to the mechanic that owned the body shop. And when I opened the door, he's like, hey, what's that book? And I said, oh, that's, that's my work. And he looked through it and he's like, oh, he's like, you want to trade for a painting? And I was like, for sure. So I did a painting for him and he did all the body, made it look like brand new again. You know, so it was like, I went to his house, picked up the truck at the shop, went to his house, brought the painting, hung it from him, shook his hand. And we, you know, we went our separate ways. And to me, that's, a, I have a lot of stories like that. And to me, that's the real crux of it is the combination of that and being able to do it for currency as well is because the trade of being an artist or a tradesman of any kind is that idea of moving around the world and doing what you do and being able to survive. And hopefully if you have a code of ethics to you, you make the world a little bit better of a place each time you do it. That's really cool. Okay. Now I want to, I want to comment. You, you're sometimes you can see in the background, a little van, uh, camper van right there. Yeah. So, um, I got so excited that I realized that you do these camper van wraps because I, my son and I, my oldest son and I, um, had this plan, or at least I, I should really say I had this plan that I was going to get a van and we were going to rehab it, make it like into a boy scout project and rehab the inside. And then like, I made this like declaration. I'm going to see if Lebo, we can get a wrap, Lebo wrap around it and blah, 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 blah. And then finally my husband and my son said to me, you're not doing this. Okay. It's not happening yeah. because, because, and I understand why, because if you look to the back of me over here, there's a, a jigsaw puzzle I've been working on for three months. Yeah. You haven't finished. <laughs> right. And so they're afraid that the van is going to become a new jigsaw puzzle. It's a 3d jigsaw puzzle. If you're not careful. Yeah. <laughs> No, well, it's really going to be bad. And uh, they don't want that place to look like Sanford and Son around here. So That's so fair. they've told me that I am not allowed to do the camper van, which made me very sad. But what my husband did said, say was, why don't you just save your money and buy a Tesla truck when they come out? And you can make that into a camper van, which is it, it fits my, you know, mode of environmental sure. ethos, right? And uh, and and it would be a decent camper van. So, would you wrap a Tesla truck? Uh, sure. Uh, yeah, you know, <laughs> if, they, if they make it, I'll wrap it. You know, I'm, like, I'm, the, I'm the vulture of the uh, of the art world. That's fantastic. Um, yeah, so I'm definitely getting my Lebo te Tesla truck now. It's going to be a new thing. Like he's going to be selling them on his website in no time. I want to do Tesla's rockets. I want to do one of those rockets. Oh, that would be, be that would be amazing. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, then you would actually get a chance to go to Mars, sort of, yeah, remotely me, go to I'm Mars. Claustro I'm claustrophobic. I don't think I can handle it. Well, no, I was just, I was, you know, by extension, your art would get to Mars. Oh, right, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the best way. That yeah, that's, that. that's you know, you're making an impact on the surface of a new planet. Then. That would that's, be incredible. Yeah, I know. Uh, so Elon Musk's a big fan of our show, I think. So when he watches <laughs> this, Elon, I'm sure he'll me. give us a call. Get and he'll. Me. And by the way, you're welcome on our show anytime, Elon. So just, yeah. you know, let us know. Let's some rockets, some art on some rockets, Elon. <laughs> yeah. All but, right. Uh, Listen, I want to no. bring this up before we run out of time. Um, everybody, please go over to LeboArt.com. I'm definitely going to get something. I'm going to get something for outside of my house. I'm going to put it in my courtyard um, and because I want people to see it and enjoy it. I feel like a, a lot of your art, like, just makes me um it feels i i don't know how to it's, i want to say it fills my soul but it I, it brings it, joy to my it soul it does so what i like about about your art david is it's like it's playful and serious at the same time right right, right. it's like this the, the dog that i have behind me it's 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 uh coco it's his, <laughs> it's his actual dog right but like coco in this painting is like really playful and fun and it, then it has these quotes on it. Like, you know, I think it's called something like, you know, dogs are better than humans because they, uh, you know, they see, but they do not set, tell or something like that. They know right? it, but they do not tell. Yeah. yeah, right. Yeah. I should probably just read it. I should know. Yeah. Uh, you remember. I don't remember. Right. Like, it's right there. We were talking about it before. Emily Dickinson. Yeah. The Emily Dickinson quote. And it's like everything that you do. It's like, you know, even the one Jillian was bringing up, um, you know, and there's another one on that same page after the storm. Um, but but all of these things, it's like there's a fun, playful side, but then there's also this serious, introspective side to them. And it really gets you thinking. And that's what I really love the most about it. Um, and I didn't realize it, honestly, until we met at a Park West event. And we're walking around the room and you're telling me, this is what I was thinking when I did this. And this, and every single piece, it seems like there's so much thought behind it. It's really amazing. I think you think more than any person I've ever met in my life. <laughs> it's <laughs> unbelievable. Oh, Oh, and, and by the way, thank you so much. If you guys, if you do go over to LeboArt.com, um, David was so nice as to give us a discount code, Last Life 20 and you get 20% off. Um, and I, it, I tried this earlier to convince him that if we put 100 behind it, we'd just get it for free, but he wasn't going to let that us do that. So. <laughs> that would be incredible. Okay. It'd yeah. Be like a bonanza. It would be a cornucopia of art. Yeah, that's right. It would be <laughs> a plume, My whole courtyard would just be Lebo art. <laughs> just a plume of art shooting into space. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Yeah. Well, but anyway, yeah, you can buy all sorts of great stuff on there. And uh, that code is now active and, and ready to go. So that's amazing. Um, so thank you for doing that. Thank you for coming back and re-recording. Um, do you have any words of wisdom you want to share before uh, you jump off here? Just remember that he who farts in church must sit in his own pew. <laughs> oh. But, um, you know, last time we asked you this, you had some like really deep introspective thing. And this time you're like, no, that was the best. Church. That was the best. <laughs> I didn't make it up. I'm just passing yeah. it along as they oh, say. Oh, God, it's so terrible. You know, we actually tell really stupid jokes on our post interview inter interviews. Like, so Jillian and I, like, when we're done, we, we, we leave and then we go back and we re record uh, like an intro and an outro. And we always tell really stupid jokes. And I have this art joke that I told the very first episode of Last Life Ever. And that was, what is red and smells like blue paint? I don't know. Blue paint? Uh, red paint smells like blue paint. So what's red and smells like... Joke. Yeah, I really did. I you screwed up my up own joke. joke. I did. So what, the answer is red now. paint, Nemo. It's red paint that smells like blue paint. What smells oh like shit? God. Your fucking breath as you tell me that joke. Because oh, we're going to have to joke. bleep that now. We have to bleep <laughs> you out. You're the first person. Who are we bleeping it for? I, I, he's the first person we've ever had to bleep on our show. No, we're not that, bleeping that joke him. was horse shit and your delivery was horse shit. Uh, it's true. It was really bad. It was way better the first time when I told it in March. If well, you had been paying attention back in March, I wouldn't have had to retell the joke. Way too much has happened <laughs> since then. But you're, yeah. but I will stand by the fact that your lips look like two caterpillars made of sweetest ambrosia. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for that. That is the nicest compliment you've ever given me. That's what you get. That's what you get from me. Oh, my God. All right. I'm Jillian Sidoti. <laughs> And I'm Jeffrey Holes. And I'm Jeffrey Holes. <laughs> no, you're not, actually. And but I'm you know, Levo. That you are the Lebo. Hey, you know what? 
Uh, if you guys want to see more Lebo, just let us know in the comments and we'll um, never bring him back because he's insulting. <laughs> ever, because I'm never going away. I'm going to be inside you forever. I know. Well, I, you're already all over my house. Like I have like I, I have like 30 of your um, sketches and like paintings and stuff. And no, I even no. have a there's Not even a enough. postcard behind me on my window. Yeah, oh yeah. Know. This is this is how Lebo's getting his Tesla truck because <laughs> yeah, <that's right. laughs> I want to see some of my stuff in Jillian's curio cabinet next. Yes, it's gonna <laughs> happen. I'm going to. I'm going to. That is what I'm gonna do. I'm literally after we get off here, I'm Actually, gonna go. Actually, Jillian, you need to follow him on Facebook because his Facebook lives where he does the little auctions of like found art objects that he repaints. Amazing. He you goes to, to watch that. I'm gonna start watching yeah. that with my son Tommy. Yeah, so he goes to like yeah. antique stores, uh antique malls, he buys these like you know, antiques, and then he literally will like just do make them into art on the spot. I mean, they're already art, but then he makes them into his own art and then he auctions them off live on Facebook. It's I'm doing that. Art. I'm gonna do that with Tom, and Tom and I are gonna because my little Tom loves to do art, has art everywhere in the house. Um, and COVID-19 has kind of taken his spring out of his step. You know, just he's just not doing it as much. And yeah. I think that might be just the thing to get you him back. take one of your curios in the back, spray paint it, mark it all up, put it back. I'm going to do it. Boom. Yeah. But by the way, as an unrelated side note, because you like to barter so much, David, I'm going to make an offer to you right now. Uh -oh. I will trade you a banana slicer oh my god that is held this, no interest a banana slicer for whatever you want to give me i want you to stick that right up your <laughs> i want you to slice your colon with that um i'm not gonna do that <laughs> no, you, you should read the reviews for the the banana slicer go to amazon and read the reviews for that banana slicer it will lady. change You'll be having, you'll have banana slicers and you'll be auctioning them You know, off. we're going to have to mark this episode as explicit so it's not going to be made for children on YouTube. Like what you're children actually, are watching people who watch this show? I'm sending it to you. You can do whatever you want with it once you have it. I've got your address. It's in the mail tomorrow. You're going to get it. I promise. I'll send it to you back with a big giant of mine. Hey, you know what? If, I'll tell you what. If you paint. Um, a turd on my banana slicer and send it back. I will be the happiest Lebo <laughs> art collector ever. I'll I'll, put, I'll lay one of my turds right across that thing and send it right back to you in slices. Nice I will, slices. you know, that, whatever you got to do, my friend. All I'll the have DNA a, you want. All the now, that, now that I'm you close to me forever. <laughs> all right. On that note, you got you guys and ladies. Until next time. Until next time. I'm Julie Zanotti. I'm That's Jeffrey, Holt. Jeffrey Holt. That's David Lebo. <laughs> <laughs> Just remember to live your best life ever. Ever. Best ever. life ever. That, that's what I mean. The, the best version of your last life ever. Everyone knows that. All right, bye. Okay, wow, that was amazing. Um <laughs> I love having David on the show. That was fantastic. What What do you think? Did it Did it fulfill every uh, hope, wish, and dream that you had about the show? My uh, thoughts about him are way deeper now than they were before we started the show because the reality is is that we talked about things that transcended art, quite frankly, um, or maybe it, it didn't transcend art. Maybe I don't get it. Maybe no, that's I, the problem. I, I think, yeah, so I think that, I mean, of course, we'll let, uh, you know, our guest speak for himself, but I think what his point is, is that everything is art, and you have to, like, sort of embrace the totality of existence, and that's why he incorporates, like, ancient Eastern philosophy into his art, and quotes from Emily Dickinson, like he has in the painting behind me, it's just... He just brings in all this really, really insightful and thoughtful stuff. And he's just a brilliant guy. And it's just really amazing to have had the chance to talk to him. One of the things that I found, you know, obviously that big long winded question I asked him in the middle of the interview was about, um, you know, becoming an artist. And, and I couched it in a way of like that. It's hard to do anything in this world these days. Um, and so it's hard for a, a young kid to conceptualize becoming an artist if they don't see any money in it. And, um, and so we kind of just, we explored that a little bit. And one thing he had, he totally admitted to, which I thought was really awesome of him was that he had an amazing support system. Uh, he had a great parents and a great brother and, 
and just great people around him who completely encouraged and supported him. And then he also had great mentors. And so one thing I got out of that was, you know, I have one child who's very much into art and that I just need to be incredibly supportive of those desires to be an artist on his part, but also not just that, but also tell, you know, give him the, the, the skinny on the fact that he's got to work really hard. He's got to work really hard and he's got to totally, sur the word I think he used was surrender himself to art if that's something he wants to do. We all have to surrender ourselves to whatever it is we want to do. Yeah, no, I thought that was really, really insightful. And you might even want to share that exact part with your son, because if he wants to be an artist, he's going to have a lot of work ahead of him, right? Because it's not... Uh, it's it's not for the faint of heart, I think. I mean, you know, people, there are lots of people that sort of dabble in, in art. And there's nothing wrong with that, by the way. Pursuing your hobbies is something we talk about a lot on Last Life Ever, is that if there's something you enjoy, it doesn't have to be your career. You can just enjoy it, right? And that's super mm -hmm. important. But uh, if you want to do it as a career, like, like our guest today did, you have to uh, you have to fully embrace it and you got to work really hard. In fact, I think you said at one point, he said, you have to work way harder to do this as a business than you do uh, to just go work for someone else. Right. And I right. think that was really, really interesting as well. And, and, you know, and he also said that even if you didn't have that support system in place, you still can do this. You, you just have to look for mentors and look for, he said he believed everyone had guardian angels. And, that and was pretty cool. Yeah. And that, that he thought that everyone has someone looking out for, for them. <laughs> And I thought that was fascinating. I think we have to also explore that a little more uh, the next time we interview him, because he actually mentioned guardian angels several times and neither of us like asked him about that, which is, which, which I feel like I didn't I know, I feel... we do an interview. Like, why didn't I ask that guy that? Yeah, ne next time we just need to interview him for like two hours instead of 30 minutes, because I could listen to him talk forever. Uh, and we're going to have to make him like come and do a presentation for us or something. Like, I don't know <laughs> what we're going to do, but like, he's just a fascinating person. He's so insightful. And if you um, are watching this now as a Facebook live and you didn't see the interview, you should jump over to our group and watch it. Um, anyway. So, Jillian, what else is going on in your life? Now we can move on a little bit from, from the episode we just finished. What, what, what else is going on in your life today? It's hot as all get out in Southern California right now. And if you're watching this on video format, then you can see that I'm not in my usual setting. I actually moved out of my office and into my house because the AC in my office is, is really abysmal and doesn't really do much for me. So here I am uh, sitting, uh, sitting in my house uh, in the nice air conditioning, very grateful for air conditioning right now. Um, yeah. So, and we also started, uh, we started our homeschooling adventure last week and we're well into that now. So uh, I am, I am teacher Jillian now. It's Professor Sidoti. That's what we're Professor calling Sidoti, it. Yeah. Professor Sidoti. And so, Mr. Sidoti is, pro, my, is yeah. Derek because we're both in we're both in it to win it. That's right. Right. So Professor Sidoti, let me ask you a question. Uh, when uh, how is uh, the teaching part impacting your ability to get other stuff done? Like, is it is it making it more difficult to do this other stuff that you do when you're not teaching your children? Or are you able to work through that? Yeah. Um, I don't know. I, I guess we're only in week two right now. And we, I mean, the kids and I had to spend a lot of time this weekend on working on some of their stuff, just catching them up, making sure they were in the right place, doing the right things. Um, you know, one of, one of the lessons I definitely had to learn was not trust that they got something done, not that they didn't get it done, but that they didn't get it done correctly. So there is a lot of, of that, um, that we have to work on. And then also, you know, one of them is in kindergarten. So he needs a lot more direction. It's not, he needs actual direction and guidance. And so fortunately, you know, Derek's here too. Um, so one of the things I've had to, I guess, if you want to call it a sacrifice, I, I don't really view it as that. Uh, but one of the things we've had to sacrifice is I'm just not taking as many clients. I'm not working as much. It's just the way it is. Um, and I'm okay with that. Uh, you know, as long as all my employees are getting paid, um, and as long as I'm making a little something, it's okay. I'm okay with not 
you know, killing it every month. How very last life ever of you. I'd love to hear that actually, because one of the things that I think about a lot is that people, especially high performing people like yourself, have a tendency to overwork and focus too much on the number. And there's nothing wrong with that. If you really want to make a bunch of money, I don't have an issue with that. I don't have any problem with it. But sometimes that gets in the way of life. And mm -hmm. if you let it get in the way of life, then you're not making, your priorities are wrong. Um, Jeff, and you and I know, because we've talked about this offline before, but I have in the past made the wrong choices and the wrong priorities. Uh, and well, you're not now. now. In the past doesn't matter. What matters is right now. Matter. Yeah. So right now, right now, and, and it's still an effort. Like, don't get me wrong. Like, so for anybody who's hearing, like, thinking like, oh, Jillian had this epiphany and now everything's great. It's not. It's, I... I am still learning and still trying and still getting over, you know, the anxieties of like, if I don't take care of this for, you know, or if I don't take this client or if I don't do this thing, then, you know, all these other things are going to happen. And, and the reality is, is that 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 is a constant thing I have to reteach myself almost daily um, that I don't have to do all the work. I don't need all the clients. Not all clients are created equal. So, you know, I need enough to, like I said, take care of my employees and take care of my family. But my number one priority right now is um, the education of my children. And I am building, I'm building Last Life Ever. That's another priority. And I'm building another business with my friend, Charlie Dobbins, who's, an, who's also a lawyer, where, you know, again, uh, I, I, say, I say it during this interview with Lebo and I'll say it here again. My whole thing right now, my my purpose through both Last Life Ever and Multifamily War Room is to teach people how to build generational wealth. To me, with what has happened with COVID nineteen, with what is happening in the world, uh, and how how you know I look at Harvard is charging their students the same tuition as if they were at Harvard, and to me that's that's unfortunate. Um, for these students who worked hard just to get into Harvard and now they can't even go to Harvard and they're being charged that same amount. How about we take the sting of all that hard work and the cost um, that it might be costing by by building generational wealth for, for the next generation? So uh, that's what I'm looking, that's, that's my purpose in life right now, if you will. That's your why, huh? That's my why. That's your why. I love it. So you have to have a why. So, you know, I don't, the generational wealth thing is great. Um, not having children, it doesn't resonate with me to the same sure. level I think it does with you. Of um, for me, my why is I want to help people not have to do things they don't want to do. Right. Like that's like, and, and, and really that's the same thing. Ultimately you're it saying, is. I yeah. want to help people live to create generational wealth so that their children don't have to do things they don't want to do. And that's totally important to me, right. but I want, not to have to do things I don't want to do. And fortunately, there, are, there aren't a lot of things I have to do I don't want to do. I mean, we all have some of that, right? But I don't, I don't, I'm not stuck in a career that makes me, you know, sad every day I get up in the morning and I have to go to work and I like am miserable. I've been there, done that. I don't want to do that again. Uh, and I don't think other people should do it either. That's why I like interviewing people like Lebo who does what he wants. I mean, he talked about that very thing. I mean, that's he's like perfect. Like just, he didn't want someone to tell him what he did. He had to work really hard, but he, but he didn't want to be told what to do. Right. And that's, that's amazing. And for me, um, I think that's, that's sort of my why that's why last life ever exists in my mind and why I'm, I care about it and why we're working together to build this is because we both are trying to get to the same point from a little bit different angle, but the same exact point. So uh, it's almost time to wrap up the show here, Jillian, but you know, we like to have jokes. So do I you know. have a joke for us today? Well, yes. And I think it is so good because at one point in time, uh, Lebo said he, uh, he used to go to like, not sketching parties, but he used to hang out with his friends and sketch. I can't remember how oh, he, he had some it. kind of crazy thing. He called it like Kung Fu sketching or something. Yeah, but, but he, you know, he, something he crazy. it in this weird way that it made it sound like he was in like a dark alley sketching. <laughs> yeah. It's like, it's like when, when he was a teenager and he wanted to be really rebellious, he went out and drew stuff. Yeah. It's good. Yes. <laughs> sketch. So that, okay. So, so here's my joke. Why did the police officer arrest the artist as a murder suspect? Uh, Cause he was really sketchy. He was a sketchy dude. Yes. Very yeah, good. Sketchy dude. All right. So 
I have a joke also. Now you remember um, one of my favorite jokes I ever told was, uh, you know, how what is blue and smells like red paint? Do you remember that joke? I, yes, and yes. I still what is what is blue and smells like red paint? For people who don't know, it's blue paint. <laughs> right, because paint smells the same. I but, still love that. It. Yeah, I love it, and it's sort of an art-related one. But I wanted something a little different because I've already used that one. So, all right. So, what happened when the ship carrying red paint ran into a ship carrying blue paint? All all of their crew were marooned. <laughs> it's, okay, and with that, everyone. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us for this episode of the Last Life Ever podcast. And Jeffrey's going to remind you to live the very best version of your last life ever. Never gonna take my freedom.